Hey everybody, welcome to chapter two of our text. We're going to, uh, in this chapter, define some key terms that are very important for you to understand before you can move forward. Now remember, you're going to read the book, watch this video, take the quiz, watch the other elements in the uh, module, take those quizzes, and then move on to the discussion board. Discussion board first post Wednesday, and then post to three classmates by Saturday. Okay, with that said, let's move on to the next slide. <coughs> Foss in 2002 defined stressors as anything that potentially leads to change, because change is stressful. Now, stressors themselves are neutral. In other words, I might be stressed by something that wouldn't stress you at all, and you might be stressed by something, and I'd look at you like, why is that so stressful for you? So stress is different for every person, but in all cases, when we experience stress, we have to adapt to change to respond to that stress. In the table below, you can see several classifications of stressors, individual, family, and community. So individual stressors include internal, situational, non-ambiguous, volitional, hazardous events or situations, chronic, and isolated. Family stresses include external, transitional, ambiguous, non-volitional, precipitating factors or incidents, acute and cumulative, and community stressors include sociocultural. Now that doesn't make sense to you yet, but it will as we move on because we're going to define these terms. So let's move to the next slide. <coughs> Excuse me. So there are three kinds of stressors that, that we're going to look at in this course. Individual, family, and community. Now keep in mind, we're going to really focus on family stressors more than the other two. So the question is, does the stressor emerge or originate from an individual, from a family, or from a community? So individual stressors include things like um, illnesses or job losses or starting school, which you all had to do, getting married, going on vacation. Family stressors include things like divorce, abuse, moving, having a child. All those things stress a family. Community stressors include things like hurricanes, wars, paying taxes, or bank failures, or job, you know, when industries move out of town, that affects the entire community, affects the entire community. Next slide, please. Stresses can be internal to the person or external. So the location or the blame or the perceived responsibility for the stressor which is subjective. Remember, every stress affects different people differently. That determines whether we classify them as internal to the person or external to the, to the person or outside the individual's controls. Families find it more difficult to cope with stressors inside the family because those tend to push families apart while external stressors tend to draw them together. So here's an exa some examples from Table 2.2 .2 of internal stressors of being abused, chronic gambling, contracting AIDS, being deserted, inability to bear children, increased tasks and time commitments, marital infidelity or relationship infidelity, mental illness, not, not being supported, having a premature or unwanted pregnancy, um, having a premature baby or an unwanted pregnancy, or, or becoming pregnant before you intended to, role conflict on understanding uh, who you are or what you're supposed to do, or having two roles of conflict with each other, such as being a mother, being a student, and being uh, an employee. All those three roles conflict with each other. Running away, running for elections, school problems, strained relationships, suicide. External stresses include things like being discriminated against, so uh, that discrimination comes from outside, an economic depression in society, kind of like what we're going through right now, a uh, recession, certainly lawsuits, natural disasters, political revolutions, like January 6th, right? A rape, robbery, terrorism, and war. Next slide, please. Stresses can be situational, transitional, or social, social cultural. Now, situational stressors are material, personal, physical, and or interpersonal losses. These are things that are anticipated, unanticipated, and they may be related to our life choices. For example, if I'm struggling with addiction and I 
um, keep borrowing money from people. Eventually, people stop talking to me, right? And so I have a loss uh, in my life. That could be a situational stressor. Next slide, please. Transitional stressors are the life passages that occur when we move from one status in life to another, such as from childhood to adolescence, from adolescence to young adulthood, from young adulthood to middle adulthood, from singleness to being married, from uh, being a line worker to being a supervisor. And they involve changes in our roles and responsibilities. Now, there are universal normative um, evolutional transitions that are developmental or life cycle transitions. Uh, and thus, we can prepare for those, like family life cycle transitions, moving from uh, a single to being married, or from married with young children, or married with uh, adolescents, or launching children, uh, you know, moving as a couple to middle age, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those are normal. We can prepare for those. However, there are some that are non-universal, non-normative uh, transitions. There are shifts in status that are not experienced by every individual or family, such as uh, losing your house and becoming an unhoused person. Next slide, we'll look at social cultural stressors. Now, now social cultural stressors stem from uh, values, uh, such as values about um, uh, race, age, gender, sexual preference, how we value these things, or how we think about these things. Can become, can be, they can emanate from a socialization. Um, if we've been socialized to be abusive to a spouse uh, or how we express our anger. Social cultural stressors can result from deviance, the deviant behavior of self or others, such as crime. Um, if you've ever been a victim of crime, and most of us have, you'll notice that that's a, a stress that's imposed on you by society. Or it can come from conflict, uh, such as having a clash with somebody else. Next slide, please. Now, stressors can be either ambiguous or non-ambiguous. Non-ambiguous stressors are those where the facts are clear and the family knows uh, when and how and how long and to whom the stressor occurs. It's a very clear stressor, such as an expected death after a long illness. However, there are ambiguous stressors as well, and those are where the facts about the stress are unclear. We don't understand what's happening. We don't understand why it's happening. Because it's not clear when such trouble will come, it's difficult to deal with these kinds of stressors, such as unexpected illnesses, terrorist attacks, or hurricanes. Next slide, please. Stress has some volitional factors, and volition refers to our will, uh, what we can do about it. So stress from volitional or chosen factors are easier to manage stressors. Uh, volitional stressors are those that are wanted and sought, such as a job change, college entrance, marriage, a wanted pregnancy. These are chosen. Non-volitional stressors, unchosen stressors, are not sought, not desired, and thus, they lead to more stress, such as getting fired or being sued. Next slide, please. We also need to talk about hazards and precipitants. A hazardous event or a hazardous situation is one that is stressful, but may not precipitate a crisis, um, such as when a hurricane comes and it wipes out much of the city but doesn't touch your house. Uh, that's a hazardous event that's stressful but may not precipitate a crisis, while precipitating factors or precipitating incidents can become the straw that broke the camel's back or something that occurred after the hazard. So, <clears throat> for example, some people after uh, the hurricane um, kind of become very activated and get involved in rebuilding the city and doing whatever it takes to make life better for themselves and others, their family and others. However, sometimes when you go through that, I remember after Hurricane Katrina, I was doing quite well, very active, very busy. My house had been flooded. We had moved to another city temporarily. I was very active in helping people relocate and getting ready to rebuild houses. And then one day I was sitting in the library 
uh, because I didn't have internet access at the time, trying to do some work. And it, I just, I couldn't concentrate, couldn't do it. And that was a straw that broke the camel's back and I just fell apart. So we need as social workers to be able to identify the original hazardous event that was stressful, but didn't bring about the crisis. And then the later per precipitant, the thing that broke the, the straw that broke the camel's back that brought about the crisis. Stress and crisis are two different things. And so we need to think about the first situation that was stressful, but not crisis, and then the precipitating event that is crisis oriented. Next slide, please. Now, stress can be either chronic or acute. Chronic means long term, acute means in the moment, but very intense. Chronic stressors last a long time. They're also known as strains. And they leave people vulnerable to crisis, illness. Long, I have a friend that's had 33 surgeries in 33 years. Um, that's a chronic stressor. Economic conditions, living in poverty for a long time. Social conditions, living with racism or living in a, um, a rough neighborhood with high crime. Uh, living near danger or living near noise. Those kinds of things are chronic ongoing conditions. Acute stressors are those that happen suddenly, last a short time, but are still severe, such as a hurricane or a tornado or an accident that occurs. And thus, they make the stress difficult to manage. These are known as acute stressors. So chronic, long-term, acute, um, shorter term, but still very powerful. Next slide, please. Stressors can be isolated or cumulative. So isolated stressors occur without other stressors and thus they're easier to manage. And so if you lose your job but everything else is going well in your world, um, you can go out and find a new job. But if you lose a job and your uh, marriage is falling apart, and you're about to lose your house, and you don't have enough money to pay the bills, and you're worried about where the next meal is going to come from, those are cumulative stresses. They begin to add up. Multiple stresses occurring at the same time, and they allow no time to resolve the previous stress before the second and third and fourth and so on happen. Now, there's two ways of looking at cumulative stressor. There's the individual pile when the multiple stressors affect a single person. But there's also something called a family pile when the family experiences cumulative stressors and the entire family's in stress. Next slide, please. So we need to define what the stressor is. Is it a hardship that happened to the person? Is it individual? family or community? Is it desirable or undesirable stress? For example, desirable stress, getting a job promotion, getting a new job, uh, graduating from SUNO, um, going on vacation. Those are all things that we want. Undesirable stress are things that we don't want. Job loss, becoming homeless, loss of income, loss of health. And there's other Two other concepts that we really need to think about when we think about defining stressors, and that is eustress and distress. Now, what we typically think of as stress is usually distress. It's the kind of stress that we don't want. Dis means against. So that's kind of stress against a person or against a family. A distress is what we think about when we think about job loss, marriages falling apart, exams piling up. Um, the end of the semester, those are examples of distress. Eustress are things that are stressful, but also desirable. I mean, it's stressful to go on a vacation, but doggone it, we sure look forward to vacations, to vacations, don't we? Or it's stressful to get married, but it's a wonderful thing at the same time. And so some stress is good stress, some stress is distress or bad stress, and EU before something like euphoria means good. Good stress, bad stress. Next slide, please. 
Now, people cope in different ways with stress. We've already talked about how some people experience stress differently than others. That's because they have different kinds of coping techniques. Coping is the transformative process of managing distress, both by the individual and by the family. See, in a family, even if one member of the family is not coping well, the entire family is, not, is struggling. Remember the picture from the last set of slides with the car that was taken apart? Well, when you think about that car, if it's put together, but you take out even just one tire, the car doesn't work so well. Or you take out one spark plug, or you remove the brakes, just one piece of the car, remove the steering wheel, the car doesn't work so well. In a system, a family system, when one part is hurting, the entire family is hurting. When one part's under stress, the entire family's under stress. And so coping then becomes a family technique. Next slide, please. People draw upon resources to cope with stress. Now those resources can be personal or individual. They can be family resources, or they can come from the community. So let's think about this for a moment. What are some ideas about personal, individual coping resources? Well, things like having your health, being intelligent, having a body of knowledge, like the knowledge that you're obtaining in this class and in the School of Social Work, personality traits, skills, such as those skills you'll have when you leave SUNO and go into the world of work. Time. Uh, when we have time, we have time to cope. But if you're going from work to school, taking care of a family, you have less time to rebound and recover. So those would be some examples of personal individual coping resources. Families well, within the family or intrafamilial, uh, microenvironmental, the, the small environment of the family, have coping resources as well. Things like being appreciated, having clear boundaries so that kids know that they're going to be okay because their parents are going to, their parents are going to take care of the kids. Um, or knowing um, what your boundaries are, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable to you. Communication skills, an egalitarian marriage, partners that are willing to work together instead of having an up and down relationship. Being organized as a family. Um, having good interactions and time to interact with each other, like family meals, being respectful of each other, supporting each other, being able to trust each other are great techniques for coping or skills, resources for coping with stress. Now, the community provides coping resources as well. There are people in our communities that are helpful to us, friends, family, neighbors, um, people in our church, uh, people in our social aid and pleasure clubs. There are groups that are helpful to us, like um, the faculty of the uh, School of Social Work at SUNO, or um, you know, a small group in your church, or a therapy group, or a, I don't know, a sewing group or a reading group. And then there's institutions like SUNO, or your church, or um, the organization that you work for. These also can provide coping resources for folks. Next slide, please. There are strategies that people draw upon to cope. Some of these are healthy and some are not healthy. Negative, dysfunctional, unhealthy, or disabling coping strategies may relieve stress in the short run, but lead to harmful side effects in the long run. For example, if I decide to drink to cope with my stress, that may temporarily anesthetize my pain, but as I rely more and more upon drinking to ease my stress, I begin to have problems. Or if I start to use uh, drugs, if I, I develop a uh, heroin addiction because it mellows me out and helps me calm down from my stress, the next thing you know, I've got a heroin problem, right? And so that would be a negative, dysfunctional, unhealthy, or disabling coping strategy. Some, though, are positive, functional, and healthy and enabling. They usually have more positive, long-term benefits that can enhance family function. Now, there are three levels to these coping strategies. Level one coping strategies require first-order changes, such as changing behaviors, rules, roles in the family, and they're used during times of relative stability to avoid stress. Level two coping strategies are more complex 
and they involve ch subtle changes to the structure of the family. In family therapy, uh, if you become a family therapist, you'll discover that, um, that there are techniques of helping reorganize the structure of a family so as to eliminate stress. Having people communicate directly or having parents uh, set the rules for the kids and set boundaries and set limits on the kids. Level three coping strategies require very big changes. Changes in the way we think, the way we believe, our values, our philosophies, even sometimes changing fundamental spiritual beliefs. Next slide. Coping strategies may also occur at the level of the individual, the family, or the community. Individual strategies may include things like direct action that strengthens an individual's resources, that helps them reappraise or externalize the blame instead of blaming themselves, or um, they may be anxious reactions when stress seems ambiguous and unclear. Family strategies may be aimed at maintaining the way the family integrates and works together, helping the family love themselves and like the family better, improving morale and or the self-esteem of the individual members and a sense of belonging in the family. And then community coping strategies are behaviors and attitudes performed by the community to reduce distress, changing policies, uh, implementing programs, those kinds of things. Next slide, please. We also need to talk about crisis. Now, stress and crisis are two different things. Stress is what happens uh, either inside or outside a person. Remember, we talked about internal versus external stressors. So what happens to a person, but the crisis is after the straw breaks the camel's back, when the family, you know, the individual kind of goes into crisis mode. Crisis can be acute, which is a few hours to maybe a couple weeks. It can be moderate, which would be a couple weeks to maybe a couple months, or a severe distressed state of being, which is ongoing and can really deeply affect somebody throwing them into major depression or an anxiety disorder. Now, individuals have crises that are behavioral, and they do things differently. Cognitive thoughts, emotions, they can fall apart emotionally. Biologically, certainly it affects your health if you're under stress for long periods of time, physical. Spiritual, you can have a spiritual crisis and or interpersonal. Uh, in a crisis, such as uh, losing a child, uh, so often parents divorce or separate. Family crises are manifestations of stress that change the boundaries or the roles or the rules and completion of tasks uh, that throw families into a situation where they're unable to perform their usual roles or tasks. They have trouble making decisions as a family. They can't solve problems. They have trouble caring for each other and they can become focused on individual survival versus family cohesiveness, which breaks a family apart. Next slide, please. Crisis management needs to occur when a crisis happens. Crisis management is the attempt to relieve the crisis manifestations of the crisis state and to return to the same level of functioning, a higher level of functioning or a functioning that maybe is even worse, but comparable to before the stressor led to the crisis state. Some people, when they experience crisis, improve. Somehow that stimulates them to higher actions. Some people, when they experience crisis, fall apart and things are worse. And other people just kind of want to get back to a steady state, the place where they were before. So that would be three outcomes of crisis management. Next slide, please. When a family is recovering from crisis or reorganizing itself after crisis, there is a turning point. That turning point is where the crisis starts to turn from you know, negatively affecting the family to the family then reorganizing itself in a way that it can once again survive or even thrive through the crisis. So there's a turning point in either the stressor, for some reason the stress is no longer stressful, resources used for coping, now they have resources that they didn't have before, 
or they had the resources but weren't using them. So now they're implementing those those resources and scoping strategies, or they just simply redefine the stressor. Um, we're not going to let this bother us anymore. Changing a combination of those four, or even one of the above, can lead the family to a place of recovery. Next slide, please. In crisis, the crisis has an eventual outcome or an eventual resolution. Now, crises outcomes, as I've indicated already, can be classified in three ways. Negative, which is a return to the pre-crisis level of functioning. Neutral, or a failure, I should say, to return to the, to the pre-crisis level of functioning. So now they're doing worse than they were before. Neutral, where they get back to where they were, or even positive, uh, returning to a higher level of functioning and thus an enhanced ability to function in the face of future crises. Because they solve this crisis, they can apply that learning to the next crisis. So what's the purpose of crisis? The crises happen in all of our lives. Well, crisis is an opportunity. The Chinese allegedly have a word for change. And that change is crisis plus opportunity. And when crisis and opportunity meet, in other words, when a crisis happens and then there's an opportunity for change and persons willing to take advantage of that opportunity, they then can change their lives for the better. So crisis is an opportunity to reach a higher level of functioning and could result in growth and development towards a positive outcome. The family can convert old negative patterns into improved ones. And that's our goal as social workers, right? Next slide, please. So I want to end by thinking through um, the terms resilience, resiliency, and resilient. Resilience is that ability to snap back after crisis happens. Resiliency is that internal capacity to, uh, to snap back. And a person who is resilient or a family who's resilient has that capacity. These words describe the strengths perspective, the ability to use protective factors of strengths to cope with stress. They refer both to the capacity of an individual or family to cope with stress and the process that they use. Now, the capacity is the internal ability, and the process is the way they do things. Remember, we're always thinking about content and process in social work. Content being the capacity, process being the way they use that capacity. Now, with those terms in mind, I want you now, because you've read the text and you've heard me elucidate on it, go to the quiz on this lecture. And after you're finished and have passed that quiz, you'll get three tries. After you've passed that quiz, I then want you to move on to the next elements of the unit, ending with the discussion. See you on the flip side, folks.